As we've been preaching through uh, the Bible here, and we are in a current sermon series called Broken Kings, as we are looking at the insufficient kings of the Old Testament in light of the all-sufficient God. I believe one of the things as we read through the Old Testament, we see several different kings listed out there and uh, that were leaders of Israel and their insufficiencies uh, in comparison to God, that only God should sit on the throne of our heart. And today, uh, last Sunday, we kind of changed lanes from looking at the kings of the Old Testament, the kings of Israel, to looking at God and saying, God, what is it about your character and nature? Last Sunday, we talked about how God is what? A refuge. God is a safe place. He is somewhere we should, should dwell. Today, we are moving a little bit further into the character and the nature of God that we want to uh, bring to our attention and celebrate and lean into. And hopefully, my prayer is today that, that you will find a great sense of peace learning about this characteristic of God. Uh, as I was preparing for this, Fred, I, I looked back and it reminded me of a song. I tried to teach to my children this week. They didn't catch it so quick, but it was a song by the Mississippi Mass Choir. Now, if you don't know who the Mississippi Mass Choir is, Google them. Amen. But this was a song I grew up in church singing, and the title of the song was Your Grace and Mercy. Now, the lyrics say, Your Grace and Mercy, they brought me through. I'm living this moment because Oh, somebody else sung the song as well. I want to thank you and praise you too. It's your grace and mercy that brought me through. It brought me through. I remember singing this song in my daddy's church, uh, uh, the mass choir. If you don't know what a mass choir is, we can talk afterwards. But essentially, it's the senior choir. It's the male chorus. It's the gospel choir and the youth choir all together together lifting up the voices unto the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. But this song, I got to be honest with you, was, uh, seemed a bit much for me growing up. I thought it was an exaggeration, Herb. I said, really, Lord? It's your grace and mercy that brought me through? I got to be honest, y'all. Like, I wanted to take a little bit of credit to it, and I was like, I didn't do anything. I didn't have anything to add to this. And as I've gotten old, I've come to learn that, no, truly, it is the grace of and the mercy of God, that when many of these songs are talking about the goodness of God, they are an exaggeration. But oftentimes when they refer to the goodness of us, it's an overstatement. I would like to suggest to you a list of songs that if they were more reflective of who we actually are versus who we aspire to be, it might be some songs that are titled, I Surrender Some. Yeah, yeah, no, no, some, some, some. Uh, Onward, y'all may know some of these hymns, Christian Spectator. I know soldier. I know it. I know it. I know it. Where he leads me, I will consider following. That could be a title of a song. Here's a good one. I like, oh, how I like Jesus. No, no, that doesn't really fit you. Uh, I love to talk about telling the story. Now, y'all don't know that. It's okay. Here's a good one. Sweet minute of prayer. Took you a second. It's all right. Here's another one. Let me have mine own way, Lord. Yeah, my personal favorite. Standing on the premises of God. Something that's promises. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. We'll go back and and fix it. Uh, Google or autocorrect if you type them in later on today. No, this song of God's grace and mercy is true. It is his grace and mercy that is brought us through. We are living this very moment because of the grace and mercy of God. It is not your own doing, but it is the grace of God. And as we look at First Chronicles chapter 21 today, we're going to see the characteristic of the mercy of God. And one of the things my hopes and desires for our time today is to leave appreciative of the mercy of God, but also understanding God's mercy that calls us to boldly approach the throne room of God because there is mercy for you at the cross. Amen. Let's look at, uh, excuse me, First Chronicles 21, verse 13. It says, then David said to God, this is going to be kind of our crux for the day. Then David said to Gad, excuse me, I am in great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is very great. 
but do not let me fall into the hand of man. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you might be like me, and you've been reading through First Chronicles, and you're saying, what in the world is going on here? And my hope today is to add some light to the book of First Chronicles, and specifically this story of David and his distress in light of the incredible mercy of God. If you're taking notes, we say this at Vertical Church, good students take notes. Our main idea today, write this down if you can, is God's mercy is not to let you off the hook in life, but to lead you to return to him in your heart. We got to understand mercy. Mercy is not about letting you off. Mm -hmm. Mercy is about drawing you back. The mercy of God is not about, not about giving you a free pass. You got to hear this. The mercy of God is about getting you closer to him. It is about leading you to return to him in your heart. Let's lay some context here because our context informs our content. The book of Chronicles is an interesting book because if you've been reading like me, it seems to be extremely repetitive. If you're like me, you're saying, didn't we just read this already? Why in the world do they keep telling us about this brother David and all of his wondrous works? This word chronicles translate in the Hebrew to the things left behind. This describes the containing remnants of the monarchy history not recorded in the previous Old Testament historical books. A later title uh, would often be ascribed to the book of Chronicles as the accounts of the day, the daily matters, the, the detail, the nuance of some of these stories that were shared previously. Chronicles decides to go a little bit deeper Chronicles contains the official records of the kings, especially those in the southern kingdom after the kingdom had split. You all may remember this. This title implies that Chronicle contain, Chronicles contains material left out of those inspired historical books of the Older Testament books. This is true because it contains both the information in those books, but also some additional information. I, I like you ask the question, though, why so repetitive? Why so repetitive? The first thing, as we see here, that the writer wanted to give the readers another version of the same events. He wanted to give some, some different perspective. Chronicles and the other historical books are somewhat like the Gospels here. Uh, we see four Gospels that tell of the same story, but from a different perspective with a different purpose. The second reason why we see it being so repetitive in Chronicles is because the writer is explaining or expounding upon meaning. Everybody say meaning. Uh, the chronicler here is trying to give meaning to some of these historical narratives. Like, here's why this had to happen this way. This is what was going on at this time. And this is important because it helps them to understand where they currently are when they understand why and how they got where they are. This is important, especially for the original readers needing to remember here, this church, their history and the spiritual issues that had molded them and got them to the place that they were in. These observations, stay with me, would guide them as they sought to reestablish Israel as the promised land after Babylonian captivity. I know, I know, it's extremely repetitive, but here it is. The writer is trying to get us to see purpose and meaning behind what seem like menial historical events. No, God, remember the whole point of us doing this Bible reading plan is that there is one story that God is, is working through the line of this entire story. This is not my story. This is not your story. This, this is one story. Mm-hmm. Central subjects here in First and Second Chronicles has to be the temple of God. Someone evidently wrote these books at the end of the Babylonian exile to encourage the Israelites to reestablish their national life in the promised land. Judah here is the kingdom in view, and David is the king in view. And David's central passion is to build this, this tabernacle that would eventually be uh, built by his son Solomon. Ultimately, trying to acknowledge and recognize God as their supreme importance in their life. The message of this book is the recognition of God's supreme importance for the people of Israel. 
Now you got to ask the question, why is this important for us today? The writer's reflection, listen to me, church, the writer's reflection on the faithfulness of God to the Davidic promise and David's desire to build the temple. Here's what we look at when we read Chronicles. We see the faithfulness of God to complete what he said he would finish. I know you're saying, well, what am I reading this for? Can we just get through this? No, we have to see this for the faithfulness to God. And today we're going to see the foundation. Everybody say foundation. We're going to see the foundation of the temple and the tabernacle of God. Like, why do we have this? Why is it here in Jerusalem? Why is it there? This is going to lay a foundation for us in how we engage God. And so we see this, that the foundation I want to share with you today is mercy. The foundation of this place where we are called to meet the tabernacle, to dwell, to bring and sacrifice and and be in the presence of God is mercy. Everybody say mercy. So number one, write this down. Good students take notes. We got to see four things moving today in the text. Number one, we need to see mercy and guilt. This is tough. Mercy and guilt. You got to catch this. Mercy arises out of the shadow of guilt. There is no need for mercy if no one's guilty. Got to see this. We can't skip past this. When we look at the story, I... I will try to do my best to help us understand this, but we, we, I know for many of you, like, well, how do we get to mercy? We can't get to mercy until we establish guilt. First Chronicles 21, let's start at verse number 1, 1 through 7. Let's read it together. Let's think through this here. Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. Mm-hmm. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring me a report that I may know their number. But Joab said, may the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. And they are they not, my Lord, the king, all of them, my Lord's servants. Why then should my Lord require this? Why should it be a cause of guilt for Israel? Y'all see that? But the king's words prevailed against Joab. So Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came back to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to David. In all Israel, there were 1.1 million men who drew the sword and in Judah, 470,000 who drew the sword. But he did not include Levi and Benjamin in the numbering for the king's command was abhorrent to Joab. But God was displeased with this thing, watch the text, and he struck Israel. Now, again, if there's going to be mercy, someone's guilty somewhere. And what we see first is David's guilt. Before there is mercy, there is guilt. First, we see that there he is a disobedient to God. I know you're saying like this pastor, that doesn't seem that bad. Here's what's happening. Uh, uh, David tells his, his commander, go count all the men that fight. Go count all the men of Israel. Go count all the warriors I want to know and bring me back a number. Now, you may be saying that seems like real, like shallow. Lord, like why is that something to be upset about? Because it's disobedient to God. How do we know this? Again, the whole purpose of us reading the the meta narrative of scripture or the whole counsel of scripture, uh, Ken, in Exodus chapter number 30, verse 12, God actually warns against doing this. Let's read it. When you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give ransom for his life. Here it is to the Lord. When you number them, why? That there be no plague among them when you number them. So he says it right here, that if you decide to do a census on your own and no one gives an offering to the Lord, there will be a plague on the people. Why is this a problem? Here it is, because in that particular culture and context, a man should not count what does not belong to him. My father would say it like this. You don't need to count another man's wallet. You don't need to be in his pocket. It's not, it's not yours. You can't count it. Here's what, what David forgot, that the people didn't belong to David. They belonged to God. And so here it is. He's disobedient. He does something that God has already said that you are not supposed to do. Here's the question. Why is this a problem, church? Why is numbering a problem? Numbering the people is not essentially or necessarily wrong in itself. Everything depends on the motive. God would call the people to be counted, but, but whenever someone did it on their own, the question had to be asked, why in the world would you want to know the number of all the people? problem is, is that Joab actually points at us and shows us 
The issue is he wants to know how many men he has for his army. You got to see this. This is a problem. This is a problem here. Because remember, David is the same one that said, some men will trust in horses, some men will trust in chariots, but I will trust in the name of the Lord. David, why are you concerned with how many men you have in your army if you trust in me? You, you, see, it, you see the issue here? And, and again, we talked about this, how King Saul was a disobedient king. King Solomon was a divided king, but King David was a displeasing king. And he displeases God. His, his heart is in the wrong place. His heart is the issue at hand. He's trying, watch this, to put his trust in his army, not in God. This is why God says don't take a census. Because the moment you start counting how many people you got, then you're, you're, you're not trusting in me. The moment you, you look at how many horses and chariots and swordsmen that you have, your comfort now, your confidence is not in the God that gave you the armies. Your confidence now is in the armies, not God. The second problem we see here in the text is that, that he's guilty, but he guess what, y'all? He disregarded counsel. Oh, man, this, this hit me in the chest because... Lord, David, I've been there, brother. Right here, verse number three. But Joab said, may the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. You got to see this. May the Lord add to whose people? His people. It says, David, if God wants to grow this people, let him do it. If he wants it to be a hundred times more, he can do that. Why? Because that's his people. Are they not, my Lord, the king, all of them, my Lord's servants? Why then should my Lord require this? Watch what he says. Why should it be a cause of guilt for Israel? So Joab says, hey, bro, this is not what we need to do. You realize that by doing this, you're going to bring guilt on us? He denies wise counsel. Y'all, I can be honest. I have sinned. In spite of wise counsel. <laughs> okay, y'all, okay, y'all gonna look at me and judge me. It's all right. Uh, I, I know what the Bible said, and I still did what I wanted to do. <laughs> I had a pastor that said, Ryan, don't do it. I said, whatever. I didn't say it too, huh? I just, yeah. <laughs> We, we, I want you to see this, that the counsel here, he, he, he disregards the counsel and now he's found guilty. Joab says, reconsider this foolish endeavor. Many believe that this took almost 10 months for them to complete a census. This is time wasted that David could have been doing something else. And here it is that Joab tries to pre prevent cause of guilt for coming on Israel. And he denies it. The third thing is that the reason why he's done this is because he's determined in himself. I want you to see this, that guilt, oftentimes because you've been determined to do something in yourself. It's right here in the text, verse number four. But the king's words prevailed against Joab. Fred, this would have helped me to be inclined to think that Joab is against King David because his words went against Joab. So Joab departed and went through all Israel and came back to Jerusalem. Joab was against David and what he was suggesting. But because he is a good commander, he, he partially obeys him. We see that he doesn't even count uh, the Levites and Benjamin. It's interesting that David is now confident in himself. This is the same David that when we meet him, he slays Goliath. Y'all remember that story? And all he had then was a sling and five smooth stones. He's standing before an army and he, he doesn't have support. This is the same David that God was with him. And even though King Saul tried to give him his sword and give him his shield and give him his ar armor, he says, I don't need those things. I, I'm coming in the name of the Lord. What happened to David? That now that he is more concerned about the men that wear his shield than he is about the God that stands with him. He is guilty. This is tough for us because we don't like the idea of mercy. Because mercy implies that I have done something wrong. 
but you will never embrace mercy until you understand that according to God's word, we are all guilty. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's good news, but we can't really embrace the good news until we understand the bad news that we are guilty. Uh, The famous American evangelist D.L. Moody He is known for visiting a prison called the Tombs. He visited this prison to teach and preach to the inmates. And after finishing speaking, Moody decided he would talk to a number of the men in the cells. And he asked them, the prisoners, what brought you here? Over and over, he received similar replies. These replies included, I don't deserve to be here. I was framed. I was falsely accused. I was given an unfair trial. Not one inmate would admit he was guilty. Finally, Moody, after several hours of meeting with different men, found a man with his face buried in his hands, weeping. Moody asked the man, what's wrong? The prisoner responded, my sins are more than I can bear. Relieved, Moody find at least, finds at least one man who would recognize his guilt and his need for forgiveness. And the evangelist replies, thank God for that. Thank God that you realize that your sins are too much to bear. Thank God that you realize that you are guilty and you cannot bear the weight of your sin. He said, because now I can point you to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Church, we have to be able to say, I'm guilty. I have sinned. I'm not just a bad person that has messed up every now and then. No, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. For us to fully experience the mercy of God, listen to me, church, it's it's uncomfortable, it's hard, but listen, until you admit that you are guilty of sin, you will never truly embrace the beauty of the mercy of God. Guilt is the result of having violated a specific rule or law. It is when we cross a moral, ethical, or legal line, we are guilty. Listen to this. Not because we feel guilty. I'm not talking about the feeling of guilt. I'm talking about the status of guilt. Two different things. You cannot feel guilty and still be guilty. Somebody ought to say amen. You, you, can, you can do wrong and not feel bad about your wrongdoing and still do wrong. I know we live in a culture that wants to just say, well, it's about how I feel, my moral observation. What do I see? What is my truth? The reality is that the Bible says uh, in Romans 3 and 10, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. Feeling guilty is not a prerequisite for being guilty. Guilt is the status that we have in sin. So first thing we got to say is there is mercy. We got to understand guilt. The second thing we got to understand is wrath, mercy and wrath. That's number two, mercy and wrath. Here it is. Guilt deserves wrath. This is hard. Guilt deserves wrath. There is mercy and wrath. And wrath. If we have done something wrong, if something, if we have sinned against God, then we are deserving of the wrath of God. We are deserving of the wrath of God. So let me see if I can make it plain here. First Chronicles 21, verse 7 through 13. Here it is. God was displeased with this thing and he struck Israel. Watch this. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing. Y'all, let's just stop here for a moment. Ain't it so good to see David just like own it? He, he, he doesn't he doesn't do like we would do and be like, well, you know, Lord, so what had happened was. Da- David doesn't go through Genesis 3 and start saying, it was the man, it was the woman, it was the st- serpent. No, 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 no. David says, I have sinned against you. He says, I have greatly sinned. He owns it. Do you see that? He says, guilty. He doesn't try to justify it. He doesn't try to blame shift. He doesn't say, you don't really understand. No, he owns it. I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing, but now please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have acted 
very foolishly. Y'all, y'all gotta, I love this word. Uh, I, y'all, I can be honest. Uh, Carlos, I just wasn't bad. I was foolish. <laughs> and the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, go and say to David, thus says the Lord, three things I offer you. Choose one of them that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, thus says the Lord, choose what you will. Either three years of famine or three months of devastation by your foes while the sword of your enemy overtakes you or else three days of the sword of the Lord pestilence in the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Israel, now decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, verse 13, where we started today, I am in great distress. Watch what he says. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. Man, he's having clarity of thought now that he's repentant for sure. He, he, this is amazing, y'all. Uh, it's probably one of the only times we see in Scripture where God offers options for judgment. That's mercy in itself for him to say, all right, I'm going to give you three options. You can either, you can either uh, be overtaken by your enemies, you, you can uh, uh, experience three years of famine, or you can experience three days of plague in the land. I want us to see the evidence that, that, that David now has, has truly repented because of how he responds to this, this offering by God, this choice by God. He has this godly remorse, and it leads him to repentance. It leads him to owning this. First, Second Corinthians chapter number seven, verse nine through ten says this: "As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved. This is this remorse for our sin, but because you were grieved into repenting. You see that 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 you feeling bad about what you have done, if it does not lead to repentance." then it's incomplete. If your grief stops at shame but doesn't cause you to turn back to God, repentance is not just saying, God, I've done wrong, but repentance is turning away from the wrong and turning back to God. For you felt godly grief so that you should suffer no loss through us. For godly grief, watch this, produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. David has great wisdom here. Tevin, he says, I- I'm not going to do the three years of famine. Not going to do the three years, three months of defeated by my enemies. I'd rather fall into the hands of the Lord. I believe he chooses the third option. He understands one thing, that if he goes through famine, let's be honest, some people will die. But he won't be affected. He's the king. He won't be affected. The wealthy won't be affected by this famine. Says, man, I I, I won't go to war because, again, I won't be affected. Y'all, we just read earlier, remember, that when David sees Bathsheba, what's happening at the time? It says in that chapter, the beginning of that time was the season that kings would go out to war. Where was David? He was on the couch. If they go to war, he knows he doesn't actually have to go. But this third one is interesting. This third one of him choosing plagues or pestilence, it ravages everyone. Wealthy or poor. Important or common. Regardless, everyone will be impacted. And David here does something that is amazing. His focus now is no longer on himself. What's going to be to the benefit of him? No, he, he, he says, listen, three days, watch this, at God's sword is way better than three months at my enemy's sword. Or three years at the mercy of my neighbors. What are you talking about, pastor? If they have famine for three years, then now they got to rely on their neighbors to supply them. He said, I don't want to trust in their mercy. If they go to war for three, three months, he says, I don't want to trust in the mercy of my, my enemy. I would rather trust in the mercy of God. Remember the point of the chronicler here is trying to get the people to see God, understand the foundation of why all of this is happening. Here's what I want you to write down. Write this down if you can. If you repent, God may relent. 
Yeah, I know we live in a culture and a context where it's been preached from platforms and churches that God is going to do. God is going to take you to the next level. God is going to give you the breakthrough. I'm not here to make no promise to you that God didn't make. God may relent, and he may not. It's right here in 1 Chronicles 21, 14 through 17. Watch what happens. So the Lord sent pestilence on Israel. Watch the text. And 70,000 men of Israel fell. And God sent the angels of Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw and he relented from the calamity. Now, if you're like me, I would see this like, Lord, 70,000 men, that's calamity. But what the writer is trying to get, get us to see, it might be calamity, but it's not what they deserved. And he said to the angel who was working destruction, the angels working destruction. He says these words, it is enough. Now stay your hand. The angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of on in the Jebusite. And David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven. And in his hand, a, a sword, a drawn sword stretched over Israel. Then David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces. And David said to God, was it not I who gave command to number the people? It is I who have sinned and done great evil. But these sheep... What have they done? Please let your hand, O Lord, my God, be against me and against my father's house. But do not let the plague be on your people. Oh, man, now they're his people. Do you see David's heart change in this moment of repentance? The focus is not on him and what he can have and his army. Now he understands that they belong to the Lord. This is the mercy of God that he would relent. You got to see this, that grace, write this down if you can, is the love of God released, while mercy is the wrath of God withheld. Grace is the love of God that you do not deserve. It's the unmerited favor. One person said it like this, that grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. It's something you could not earn. But mercy, on the other hand, is you deserve something and God withholds his power. He withholds his wrath. He withholds, withholds his anger. See the difference? We got to remember this. Listen to me, church. This is tough. While David did repent, it did not absolve him of his sin. While David did repent, listen to me, church, it did not remove the consequences. This is hard for us because we live in a world like, well, Lord, I asked for forgiveness. I shouldn't have to deal with the consequences of my actions. Not true. Well, I thought Jesus Christ died for all my sins. Yes, you are justified, which means that you now have a relationship with God and you have an eternity with God, but it does not remove the consequences that happen because of sin in this earth. Listen to me, church. I'll be the first to tell you, if you come and you steal, you break the law of the land, God will forgive you and you will go to jail. He will forgive you, but you still have to deal with what? The consequences. We see David's wisdom as he says, I would rather fall into the mercy of God rather than my neighbors and my enemies. The purpose of sharing this narrative in Chronicles is to remind the reader of the covenant relationship that they have with God and the children of Israel. You got to see this. God is, is keeping them. He's relenting, not because they deserve it, but because he's such a merciful God. He says, I'm going to keep my covenant no matter what. Oh, you got to see the picture here. This picture is very similar to the picture of Abraham and Isaac. Can you see the picture of the angel of the Lord standing on mountain and he has a sword stretched out over Israel? It's just like Abraham and Isaac on the mountain where Abraham goes up to sacrifice his son under God's direction. And Abraham takes his knife out and God, the angel of the Lord says, stay your hand. Because he's going to keep his covenant here. It's interesting that David now tries to stand in the gap for the people. The angel of the Lord is standing over the children with a sword drawn is reminiscent again of abraham and in both cases the covenant promises at stake here and just like when moses tried to to intercede on behalf of the people and be the sacrifice god wouldn't receive it same thing happens here with david let's read it again verse 17 and david said to god was it not i who gave command to the number of the people y'all hear his heart 
Y'all, Lord, it was me. I didn't, they didn't do nothing. It is I who have sinned and done great evil, but these sheep, wow, now they're sheep. What have they done? Please let your hand, O Lord my God, be against me and against my father's house, but do not let the plague be on, here it is, your people. Now, remember when we saw David in verse number one of chapter 21, go count the people, mine. Now they're yours. Here's the problem. David was an unworthy sacrifice. He was an unfaithful man. He had blood on his hands. He could not stand in the gap. God would not receive his, his desired intercession that he wanted. David here, although he admits guilt, is guilt for himself. He's a disqualified sacrifice. But when I see this story, it makes me think of Jesus. It makes me think of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus, while David was guilty of sin, Jesus had no sins of his own. The people of Israel were innocent in this particular case. David wanted to intercede. Watch this on the behalf of the innocent. When Jesus Christ goes to the cross, he intercedes on behalf of the guilty. He's a much better king. David sees the people as the sheep that needs to be spared. Jesus stands himself as the lamb that needs to be slain. David asks, what have the people done? They've done no wrong. Jesus says, regardless of what they've done, I'll take the sins of the world on my shoulders as I hang on the cross and die for their sins. If we're guilty, wrath is what we deserve. But because of the goodness and the mercy of God, love is what we receive. Uh, There's a story of a mother who once approached uh, Napoleon, uh, uh, the, the emperor, and and he approached uh, Napoleon, the emperor, to pardon her son. Napoleon replied, uh, that young man had committed a certain offense twice, and justice demands death, demands his life. The woman, the mother, asked, uh, I don't ask for justice. The mother explained. She says, I plead for mercy. Napoleon responded, but your son does not deserve mercy. And the woman says, sir, It would not be mercy if he deserved it. (laughs) Here it is, that the mercy that you and I have received is not something that we can earn. It's not because you've been so good. It's not because you've crossed every T. It's not because you've dotted every I. It's not because you came crying. It's because of the love of God. Thirdly, this leads us to worship. Mercy and worship. So we have mercy and guilt, mercy and wrath. But the proper response to God relenting is worship. It's right here. David says, let me be the sacrifice. I'll die. God says, no, just, just, just build an altar. Y'all got to imagine this is a little wild. He said, Lord, it was me. It was me. And he says, okay, go build an altar. Go, go, go build an altar. First Chronicles 21, 18. He says, now the angel of the Lord came and had commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan and the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's words, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. He turned and saw the angel and his four sons who were with him hid themselves. And David came to Ornan and Ornan looked and saw David and went out from the threshing floor and paid homage to David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, give me the sight of the threshing floor that I may build on it an altar to the Lord. Give it to me at its full price that the plague may be averted from the people. And Ornan said to David, take it. Let my Lord the king do what seems good to him. See, I have given the oxen for burnt offerings and the threshing sledges for the wood and the wheat for the grain offering. I give it all. But King David said to Ornan, no, I will buy them for the full price. I will not take for the Lord what was yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David paid on in 600 shekels of gold by weight of the sight. Here it is that God instructs him to build an altar. Worship is the proper response. We see this in the Old Testament. Every time sin is committed, blood must be shed to atone for those sins. This is an interesting picture here because this really gets into the purpose of chapter 21. Here it is that God tells them to build an altar. This is going to be a divine place. Why is this guy Ornan to even mention? Why not just mention the land? Why not mention the mountain? No, it's important to understand because this was foretold here. Ornan's threshing floor was a special place. Where is it? It's in Mount Moriah. Now, you got to ask the question, why is this important? Because this is the same place that Abraham stood over Isaac to kill his son. 
You got to see it's the same place. We, we're we're going to see this mercy that God shows Abraham and Isaac. They have a scapegoat, a ram in the bush that would actually be sacrificed in place to give what? Worship to God. Uh, Abraham says to his men, uh, me and the bar are going to go up the mountain to do what? And worship. It's this picture of mercy that we see here. This is the same picture that we see in Genesis 22. Not only is it a divine place, it also has divine purpose. 2 Chronicles 3.1 would help us to understand this, that it says this in 2 Chronicles, then Solomon began the house, build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Where does he build it? On Mount Moriah. Here it is, where the Lord had appeared to David, his father, at the place that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan and the Jebusite. You see what the writer is trying to do? The chronicler is trying to help the reader to understand. Listen, the very place where you come to worship, it got here because mercy was needed. The very place, y'all got to see this, the very place where you come to make a sacrifice, the very place where we meet God, it is founded on mercy. The story, do you want to know how we got there? The story behind this particular tabernacle, the story behind this altar that was built, it was God showing mercy to a disobedient king named David. Mercy is the foundation of our interaction with God. It's his mercy. It moves us to our main point. Our last one here is that we see mercy and relationship. KJ, the whole point of mercy is that we might have relationship with God. The whole point of this mercy is about relationship. Here it is, 1 Chronicles 21, 26 through 30. It says this, and David built there an altar to the Lord. And presented burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord. And the Lord answered him with fire from heaven upon the altar of burnt offerings. Then the Lord commanded the angel and he put his sword back in his sheath. Oh, my. At that time, when David saw the Lord had answered him at the threshing floor of Ornan and the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. Watch the text. For the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses had made in the wilderness and the altar of burnt offering were at that time in the high place of Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord. I don't know if y'all saw it right there, but this is the relationship here. We finally see where, where David now builds this altar. And after he builds the altar, God responds with fire. Y'all, y'all, y'all can't miss this. Prior to this point, all of God's communication has been through somebody else. Every time he comes to David, it's through Gad, the seer. Here it is. God says, okay, I see your sacrifice. I see that you've repented. You've built an altar. I'm going to respond with fire to let you know that I accept your offering. Here it is. Relationship has always been the goal. He shows us mercy so we can be drawn to him. He shows us mercy that we might be with him. He shows us mercy that we might know him. He's not trying to let us off the hook. He's trying to draw us back in his heart. Listen, I said all of this really to get to chapter 22. I'm only going to read verse 1 because you don't understand chapter 21 unless you really read chapter 22. Chapter 22, verse 1, if you got your Bible, it's kind of separated from every, everything else. You got uh, chapter 22, you got verse 1, and then you probably got a heading for the next section of Scripture. It's almost like verse number 1 is sitting out there on its own. Uh, it's been abandoned by the Bible here. And here it is that it's connected actually to chapter 21. When you see verse 1 of chapter 22, it actually brings everything together. Watch verse 1 of chapter 22. Then David said, God, I love this. Here shall be the house of the Lord God, and here the altar of burnt offerings for Israel. Pastor, what in the world does this mean? Why isn't this included with the rest of 22? Why, why, why is it not attached to 21? Because it's, it's so powerful by itself. Then David said, here shall be the house of the Lord God, and here the altar of burnt offering for Israel. You got to see this. In the beginning of chapter 21, David is disobedient. He is guilty of sin. He, he, he has done what is displeasing to God. God uh, understands this and God sends the angel of the Lord to destroy the people. But in, in, a, in a show of his mercy and love to keep his covenant, he relents his wrath from David and tells David to build an altar. And the very place that was supposed to be just an altar of sacrifice becomes the house of God. This is the same place, the same Jerusalem, the same mountain 
where Jesus Christ would later be crucified. It's always been about the mercy of God. This picture that the writer is trying to get us to see as readers is that there is mercy for you. The foot of the cross. We should now come boldly to God because there is mercy for us. He wants to be with you. There is no guilt, no shame. There is mercy for you. I don't care what you've done. Jesus boldly says, come unto me. I've got mercy for you. Why, why, why this story? Why this story, y'all? The children of Israel would need to be reminded of the mercy of God. He is the one that is worthy to be the king on the throne of our hearts because he is the one that has great mercy. Have you forgotten about the mercy of God? Maybe you're here today and you're saying, Pastor, I I struggle with the idea of mercy because I don't like to think that I'm guilty. I'm a good person. I do nice things. I volunteer, I donate, I help people out. Let me help you understand something. All well and good. But all of sin, Romans 3 20, and falling short of the glory of God, we're all guilty. Ephesians 2 would tell us that we were deserving of the wrath of God. It says that we are we are enemies. Because of our sin, we are enemies of God. You might not feel like it, but but when you sin against God, like He says, that either you're for me or you're against me. No so in between. We deserve wrath. Here's the good news of the gospel: that Jesus Christ took the wrath that you and I deserved. It's His mercy first step the first step that you step into coming to the presence of God to come into the, the dwelling place first step is mercy mercy lets me close grace makes me his we don't even I don't truly believe we get to grace until we understand the mercy that he's relented he's shown us it's his mercy, church. I know I hear you. Pastor, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know how hard my life has been. I do believe this, though. It's not what you deserve. I'm not saying it hasn't been hard. It's not been what you deserve. heard me say this several times and I'm going to keep saying it because it's been so real to me God is not fair because if he was fair he would give you what you deserve I'm not praying for God to be fair thank God that he's merciful mercy is everlasting hmm doesn't absolve us of the consequences of sin. But his mercy is his wrath with hell. 